people are looking for just something to grab, something that gives them some sense, sense of hope. And, and that's, and if I can do a little bit of that, then it's, you know, it's worth doing. Not for me. So. This is my video update from Vienna, Austria on this October the 19th. Let's talk about some news. And let's, uh, let's start things off with Professor Biden, who uh, was speaking to reporters during his trip to Tel Aviv in Israel. And uh, he, he said some interesting things, if you understood what Biden was saying, because to be quite honest, I couldn't understand most of his statements. But uh, Biden speaking to reporters, he said that, uh, that the U.S. will stand with Israel for as long as it takes, pretty much, if I had to, if I had to sum up what, uh, what he said during these statements. And uh, then Biden said that uh, the, the attack by Hamas was worse than 9-11. Once again, you see that 9-11 comparison from Biden. I really wish they would stop saying 9-11 in Pearl Harbor and stuff like that because when I hear 9-11 and Pearl Harbor, I think of of the war on terror, which lasted 20 years or some sort of of world war. So Biden is still making those comparisons, which could lead some to believe that the U.S., the Biden White House is contemplating a larger, wider war. And uh, and then Biden, he said when he was asked by reporters about how he's so confident, how he's so sure that the missile strike on the hospital in Gaza was not uh, done by Israel, by the IDF, how he's so sure that it was done by Hamas or, or this jihadist group that uh, the IDF was, was talking about the other day as far as who, uh, who hit this hospital in Gaza. When Biden was asked about this, Biden was like, uh, I know because I got the intel and, and I've seen the intelligence from my team and you should believe me. He's like, why would I lie? That's pretty much what Biden said. Joe Biden, why would I lie? Joe Biden, who's, who's a serial liar, I mean, He's known for plagiarizing and lying. Yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm watching you every day. Great. Thank you very much. Take care. And uh, yeah, Biden. Biden is saying, believe me. Joe Biden is saying, believe me. I would never lie. <laughs> I think that's the last person in the world, that's the last leader in the world who should be saying, believe me, listen. It's beautiful. Stefan Splatz. Okay, so um, 
So yeah, those were the statements by Biden. And he was saying all of this while Secretary of State Anthony Blinken was kind of lurking in the, in the background, which was really creepy. And then Biden had this chin thing. I, I don't know what that was. But, uh, but Biden is saying all this stuff as he's speaking to reporters. He's saying, I've seen the intel. Trust me. You have to believe me. I'm Joe Biden. I would never lie. And he's saying all of this stuff while Blinken is like right outside of the, the toilets. And, uh, and that was just bizarre. It looked like Biden was like, uh, like a puppet and Blinken was the ventriloquist or the puppet master. Like Blinken may have had his, his hand underneath the, the puppet. And he was like kind of moving, moving the puppet with his hands. Very creepy, very creepy indeed. Seeing Blinken lurking there. Creepy dude that, uh, Anthony Blinken. So yeah, uh, trust the Intel. Well, Believe me, that is what Biden is telling the world. And you know, I don't, I don't know what happened. I've seen, I've seen a lot of videos, a lot of images. I've read a lot of analysis. I kind of know where I'm leaning towards on the uh, on the blast. But you know, there's videos now which claim that uh, this was all made up because uh, the the actual damage was not done to the hospital. It was done to a parking lot next to the hospital. And uh, there's images now showing a damaged hospital, showing a damaged parking lot, but not a, a damaged hospital. You know, I don't know. I don't know uh, what's what happened. I have my my opinion from what I've seen as to what happened. But, uh, you know, if Biden has the intel, then he should release it or release what he can. That would be the, the best way forward because, you know, the world is, is, is outraged. I saw videos yesterday from Athens. The protests in Athens were huge because they were so upset. Uh, pro, pro Palestinian, um, uh, protests calling for a ceasefire. Uh, outraged as to uh, what happened in Gaza and what's happening in Gaza. It's not only the hospital. I mean, bombings are taking place uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Every minute, bombs seem to be uh, being dropped in Gaza. And, and keep in mind, even if, even if the bomb did hit, or this missile did hit a parking lot, I mean, people were probably in that parking lot because they have nowhere to go. Remember that Gaza is, is one of the most densely populated areas on Earth. So pretty much anywhere a missile lands is going to kill a lot of people, a lot of innocent civilians, whether it's on a building or in a park parking lot or, or both. I just don't know what, uh, what happened. Um, one video taken the day after doesn't really, doesn't really say much or prove anything. The best way to figure out, to get to the bottom of what happened, is an investigation for Biden to release the intel that he has. If you have some intel, Speak with your intel uh, people, Biden, and, uh, and release what you have or what you can so that the situation can, can calm down a bit. It's not going to calm down completely, but, you know, so things can calm down a bit because even in, uh, in Congress, the, the building where the Congress... Uh, the U.S. Congress uh, officials, the representatives, have their offices. I think it's called the Rotunda, the Rotunda Building, I think is what it's called. Anyway, I forgot the name, but it's not like the actual uh, Congress building, but it's one of the adjacent offices. You know, they had protesters enter as well. Once again, pro, pro ceasefire, pro Palestinian uh, protesters. They entered one of the buildings, and they're calling for a ceasefire. And so the best way forward is for Biden to release what he has, if he's so confident about it, which will show that this, according to Biden, that this missile was, was uh, this jihadist or Hamas missile. If he has that, that evidence and it's crystal clear, release it. And the absolute best thing that can take place is an investigation.
That is what the UN is calling for. That is what needs to happen. An independent investigation. Let's, uh, let's go that way. Let's go for a little bit of a walk here. So yeah, that's, that's the best way forward. Get an investigation, see what happened, independent investigation, and let's find out the truth. It'll never happen. I know it'll never happen. We're never gonna get an independent investigation, but that is the absolute best way forward. And I imagine that, uh, and here's where I need your help in the comments down below. Let me know if this is possible, but I imagine that, uh, let's go this way, that investigators, okay, investigators probably can't, can't find out what happened on, on the, on the Hamas side of things, this jihadist group or Hamas. I imagine they can't get any information there, but I imagine from the uh, IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces side of things, uh, they could they could find out if they launched a missile or a bomb or a rocket, and they can investigate everything. I mean, from a forensic level, from an investig investigatory level, I imagine that uh, if Israel cooperated, they would be able to find out pretty easily if uh, this missile was indeed fired by Israel or not. They would be able to find that pretty pretty easily. I don't know, maybe I could be wrong, but that's my thinking. My thinking is that if you had an investigation and the Israeli uh, Defense Forces cooperated, they would be able to, to come back with, a, with an assessment saying, look, we, we got all the information from Israel, they were very transparent, and uh, this rocket didn't come from Israel, or or this rocket did come from Israel. I'm being naive. I'm being completely naive here. But you know, if you don't, if you don't uh, get an investigation, the escalation is just going to continue. It's that simple. If you don't get an investigation, the escalation is going to continue. And maybe that's maybe that's the plan. There are uh, there are news reports from the UK Times specifically which say that Biden's purpose for the trip to Tel Aviv was to uh, give the green light to Netanyahu to begin the ground operation. I don't know how true that is, but there are reports which claim that Biden went to Israel, he gave Netanyahu the green light and the ground operation will begin. The big concern is Hezbollah towards uh, towards the north meanwhile you have all kinds of collective west officials landing in tel aviv to do what i don't know new york governor what's her name kathy hochel the like the the, <laughs> the governor who was like not even elected i think this time around she was elected but she took over for cuomo after cuomo was was sent packing she lands in uh in tel aviv to do what who knows? I think even the Greek Prime Minister of Mitsodakis, he's going to, to Israel to do what? I don't know. <laughs> just this is this is like it reminds me of Kiev 2.0. Everyone's like just landing in the in the capital city to to virtue signal. I can't think of a better word. John Fetterman, Senator John Fetterman from Pennsylvania, he put out a tweet and he said. Now is not the time to talk about a ceasefire. We must support Israel in efforts to eliminate the Hamas terrorists who slaughtered innocent men, women, and children. Hamas does not want peace. They want to destroy Israel. We can talk about a ceasefire after Hamas is neutralized. Which is the exact wrong decision, the exact wrong statement for any senator, even a senator as, as incompetent as Fetterman. And uh, Fetterman is, he's the guy that wears shorts, like shorts and a t-shirt. That's, that's Fetterman, if you, if you don't know who I'm talking about. Um, 
now is the time for a ceasefire. Here you have a U.S. senator saying we don't, we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be trying to get a ceasefire. Which means what? Escalation? War? Is that, is that what Fetterman is suggesting? No, he's saying we have to go after Hamas. We have to destroy Hamas. Okay. But destroying Hamas is going to mean that you're going to destroy Gaza and you're going to kill tens of thousands of innocent lives. And there has to be a better way. There has to be a diplomatic solution to this. The circle of violence has to stop. It has to break. If you don't break the circle of violence, then this never stops. And this is why I continue to say that uh, Russia and China, they are, they are working to provide an off-ramp out of this mess. But it's going to take time. It's going to take time and it's going to be extremely difficult for Russia and China to, uh, to wrestle away control of, uh, of the Middle East from the United States, or at least the peace process in the Middle East from the United States. It's going to take a lot of time and it's going to be very difficult for Russia and China to take over the failed peace process that the U.S. has has been engaging in over the last decades. So, um, speaking of Russia and China, a lot of people in Vienna. This city is, this city is alive. A lot of people hanging out here for this for this uh, Tuesday, for this Thursday, you see, I always get Tuesday and Thursday confused for this Thursday uh, morning, morning, midday. So speaking of Russia, we have, we had Vladimir Putin in Beijing speaking to the media and, uh, and Putin said some interesting things. Now, when Putin talks, you know, you're going to get some, some interesting inside insights, unlike Professor Biden, who when Professor Biden talks, well, you're going to get a whole bunch of clown worlds, but uh, but Putin he uh, he, he uh, fielded questions from the media in Beijing, and uh, and they asked him about the attack homes. I talked about this yesterday in my video. They asked him about about his thoughts with the attack homes that uh, Ukraine now has in its possession. the uh, The news is that Ukraine was given anywhere between twelve and sixty. Uh, attack homes with with 160 kilometer range, like older older attack homes as well. At least judging by the photographs, um, Putin said in his uh, in his statement about the attack homes, he says that it's just going to prolong the agony of uh, of the Ukraine military. But Putin also said that uh, these attack homes. They are not going to make any difference whatsoever to the outcome of the conflict and to what's going on on the front lines. Putin said it's not going to make any difference at all. And he was, he was firm in his statement. I mean, he said it with 100% with confidence and authority. It's not going to make any difference at all on the front lines. He said, all it's going to do is prolong the agony of Ukraine. And uh, he also talked about Kherson, which I think was one of the first statements from Putin on Kherson, where we had news that, uh, that the Ukraine military, they went to launch an offensive in the direction of Kherson, uh, Rybar, which is the Russian military uh, military news telegram channel, they had reported that Ukraine had captured two villages, but uh, those reports were false, and and it is now known that uh, well that Ukraine was not able to capture two villages on the Russian side of the uh, of Kherson. And the Russians have actually pushed uh, the Ukrainians back from, uh, 
from where they were advancing, something like 70 or 80 Ukraine military were annihilated uh, just yesterday alone as they were trying to, to advance. So maybe this wasn't an offensive, maybe this was an aggressive probing or reconnaissance activity, I don't know, but a lot of Ukrainians, a lot of Ukrainian military suffered trying to, to make a move in the direction of Kherson. And, uh, you know, this is, to me, this is Zelensky once again uh, trying to get some, some attention his way because, let's face it, the, uh, the coverage on Ukraine has completely just fallen off. I mean, no one, no one is covering Ukraine anymore. Uh, Russian media, of course, is covering Ukraine because for Russia, Ukraine is is the most important. But um, collective West media, they're just not interested in Ukraine anymore. So I think Alensky, he's trying to launch an offensive in the Hetsun direction. It's going to fail. It's already failing. And um, it's not going to, to get the attention that I think he's, he's hoping to get. Either way, the Biden White House, they're saying that the $100 billion that... Uh, that they want to get passed through Congress for, uh, for military aid and financial aid to various conflicts. 60 billion of that is uh, earmarked for Ukraine. The rest of the money is for Israel, Taiwan, and the southern border. So you have Joe Biden Joe Biden, Lincoln, Sullivan, Newland. This is the this is the group of people that uh, that are going to lead America into three wars and dealing with the southern border. This is the group. <laughs> Biden, Lincoln, Sullivan, Newland, Austin. These are the guys. Kamala Harris. This is the team. This is the A team that is going to lead the United States into war with Russia, war with the Arab world, because that's what we're talking about here, um, war with China, and uh, dealing with the southern border. Yeah, good, good luck with that. Uh, speaking of, uh, of war with the Arab world, Putin said something interesting during his press conference. He said that uh, Russia Russia has deployed MiGs with Kinzhal missiles. And he said they have a range of a thousand uh, kilometers because as Putin was answering a question for a reporter, he said that the Russian military said, this is not a threat. He said, I'm not threatening when he came out with a statement, but he said that uh, he has sent on his orders, he has deployed, the Russian military has deployed MiGs with Kinzhals um, to patrol the, the Black Sea. And uh, he did this because the U.S. has moved so much uh, military hardware, aircraft carriers, and its entire, it seems like its entire navy is, is moving towards the Mediterranean. I'm exaggerating, but that's what it seems like in preparation for something big. I don't know. They, the U.S. says this is in order to deter Iran and Hezbollah, but I don't know. I'm afraid that's not what it's about. But uh, an effort for Putin to, to say this leads me to believe that he has intel that the U.S. is planning something very, very big, perhaps towards Iran. But uh, he said that he's got his, his MiGs and they're, they're looking straight with the Kinzhal missiles. They're looking straight at, uh, at the U.S. Uh, ships in the Mediterranean. Now, um, I was listening to Alexander's video and Alexander brings up the point that the Kinzhals, the MiGs, the Kinzhals are also there to intercept uh, the attack homes as well um, and to prevent uh, strikes into into the Russian Federation. So they're basically patrolling 
uh, the, the area in order to protect Russia, but perhaps in order to deter the U.S. deterrent. So the U.S. sent ships in the Mediterranean, they say, in order to deter Iran. And now it looks like the Russians, they've got their MiGs in order to deter the U.S. Uh, ships that the U.S. claims are there to deter Iran. Perhaps the Russians are there to send a message to the Biden White House to the United States to uh, to not try anything, to not try anything towards Iran, but also towards Syria. You know, I've I've talked a lot about how the U.S. how the U.S. is itching for war with Iran, but and the neocons, it's been their dream, their fantasy for the last two, three decades, four decades, to uh, to start a war with Iran. I mean, this is like the neocon um, home run. Grand Slam, you know, war with Russia, war with Iran, war with Taiwan. I mean, this is like, like a neocon dream. This is like the, the ultimate in, in fantasies. And, uh, and I talk a lot about how much of this is, much of these U.S. forces in the Mediterranean could be aimed at Iran, trying to start something with Iran, maybe a false flag. I don't know. But uh, we can't forget about Syria. You know, the neocons, they've never, they've never forgotten Syria, and they've never forgiven Russia for destroying IS and preventing the fall of uh, Assad and Damascus. Uh, never forget one thing when you have uh, U.S. politicians comparing uh, Hamas to IS. Never forget that it was the Obama administration with Joe Biden as vice president that, uh, that supported IS. And never forget that Hamas was fighting alongside IS in order to overthrow Assad. That's, that's just reality. That's the truth. Those are facts. Never forget that. So uh, we can't forget about Syria being a possible target because the neocons, they have no reverse gear. And you know that, uh, that the fact that Syria is still standing and Assad is, uh, is still standing, you know that uh, the neocons that must drive them absolutely crazy. So I'm worried about not only Iran, but I'm worried that they might try something towards Syria. And perhaps Putin is, he has the intel and he's sending the message, you know, don't, don't screw with Iran, but definitely don't screw with Syria. So, uh, so I think that's everything before we get into some, some lighter, lighter news. I guess if you could define it as such, clown worlds. And uh, Kim.com, here's an interesting tweet from Kim.com before I segue over into, into the clown world segment. A UN Security Council resolution on Iran's missile program has expired today. Russia is free to deliver hypersonic missiles to Iran. First deliveries are probably arriving at Iranian ports. Russia will support Iran in the upcoming war against Israel U.S payback for Ukraine. It's an interesting tweet from Kim.com. I've read about the resolution that expired and that Iran is now, from what I understand, is, is free to, to get missiles, hypersonic missiles, perhaps. Maybe the, the Biden White House wants to start something with Iran before Iran starts to, uh, to acquire this missile technology. I don't know, just a thought. So, Business Insider is reporting that Elon Musk is considering taking Twitter out of Europe amid EU compliance investigation, the Digital Service Act from the EU. I've talked about this a couple of times, actually, how the European Union, they are threatening Elon Musk and they're telling him that he has to start canceling uh, Twitter accounts and removing Twitter posts because they violate the European Union's Digital Services Act. And uh, Elon Musk, he's not happy about this DSA, this EU directive. And Business Insider is now saying that Elon Musk is thinking about pulling Twitter out of the European Union. I don't think so. I don't think that's what's gonna happen. But, but while Business Insider is saying this is a bad idea for Elon Musk to do, to take Twitter out of Europe, uh, Twitter, I believe their traffic from Europe accounts for 9% of the total traffic for Twitter that is coming from the European Union. I think this is a great idea. 
Uh, I've said this before. <laughs> I, actually, I said this many, many months ago. I think in a video that I did in Athens, I said this many months ago that uh, that Elon Musk should absolutely uh, call the, the EU's bluff. If the EU is threatening you, take Twitter out of the European Union, man. <laughs> Do it. And you will see that EU will fold within like a day, a week tops. Because if there's anybody, if there's any group of people that, uh, that are addicted to Twitter and addicted to the media propaganda and the media spin, it's the European Union. They won't last a week without Twitter. They won't last a week. They will be begging Elon Musk. I mean, begging Elon Musk to bring Twitter back. No doubt about it. You see, Rumble pulled out of France, but Ursula and Charles Michel and all of these guys, they're, uh, they're not addicted to Rumble, obviously, but boy, are they addicted to Twitter. They are really addicted to Twitter. And they love the, the propaganda that they, can, that they can spit out on Twitter. And so I tell Elon Musk, do it, <laughs> do it. Take Twitter out of the EU. And you will see that within a week, the EU is going to fold. They're going to fold and they're going to beg Elon to bring it back. Interestingly enough, uh, this article says that, uh, that Facebook's Twitter clone, Threads, the app is not available in the European Union because of this Digital Service Act, of which I say, who cares? Does anyone even use that Facebook clone of Twitter, Threads? I don't think anyone even uses it. Anyway, um, let's see. Now we're entering deep clown world territory. So uh, here's a tweet from Jack Posobiec. A U.S. judge sent a guy to jail for posting Hillary memes, calling it election interference. Another U.S. judge just gagged President Trump from speaking freely, but that's not election interference. The country you grew up in no longer exists. And this has to do with, uh, this tweet has to do with the news that the, I forgot his name, the, the guy that put out the memes during the 2016 election, where he had like, a, like an SMS short code to, uh, to call for, for support for Hillary Clinton or something like that, like send a code, send an SMS to this number and that's your vote for Hillary Clinton. It was a meme. It was obviously a meme. I mean, you have to be pretty, pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty challenged up here. Let me put it that way. I'm trying to be diplomatic. Uh, you have to be pretty challenged up here to believe that that was uh, that was an actual Hillary Clinton endorsed election uh, post. So uh, anyway, he put up this meme, and uh, people people thought it was funny. And uh, he, uh, he got arrested for it. He got arrested for this meme during the 2016 election. Russian, Russian meddling, <laughs> Russian interference. Anyway, uh, yeah, and he's been sentenced to prison. I think something like nine months in prison or seven months in prison, along with the time I think that he's been serving up until today. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's smart of Jack Posobiec to connect the fact that a person that made memes, fun, joking memes, has been put in prison for election interference while the entire deep state is going after Trump and they're gagging Trump from speaking freely and somehow that's not election interference. Yeah. Um, let's do a final clown world. How are we doing on time? Not bad. Not bad at all, and we covered quite a lot of ground here in Vienna. So let's do a final clown world. And for this clown world, we'll talk about Estonian Prime Minister Kaya Kalas. <laughs> Kaya Kalas. Who, uh, who came out with a statement yesterday expressing her, her anger, her dismay, her anger, her disappointment 
with Hungary, Viktor Orban and his trip to China and his meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin and Kaya Kallis in her statement. She basically said, how dare Viktor Orban meet with Putin? How dare, how dare you meet with the Russian president and engage in diplomacy? How dare you? <laughs> that is what Kaya Kallis uh, said in her statement. And so the Hungarian foreign minister, Peter Siato, he, uh, he fired back at Kaya Kallis and he basically said, exactly what which way should i go let's go let's go this way he basically said exactly what i was thinking when i heard about this statement from kaya Kalis, which is absolute hypocrisy coming from the estonian prime minister and he said with all due respect this is kaya Kalis, the same kaya Kalis whose husband was recently revealed to have had an ownership stake in a company that supplied $30 million worth of raw materials to a Russian factory, even after the war in Ukraine had begun. Despite the ongoing conflict, it's a clear case of triple hypocrisy. That is what Peter Siarto posted on his, I don't know, I think on his Twitter account or on his Facebook account or on his Telegram account, I don't know. But, uh, I think I should be up there. That's where I should be, right? That's where I should be. So yeah, triple, triple hypocrisy coming from Kaya Kalas. <laughs> yeah, how dare Viktor Orban have a meeting with, uh, with Vladimir Putin and talk about Hungarian-Russian relations and perhaps safeguarding Hungary's uh, energy security and trying to to de-escalate the conflict in Ukraine. How dare he? <laughs> Doesn't Viktor Orban know that the only the only EU leader that's allowed to to do business with Russia is Estonia? <laughs> Doesn't he know that? Didn't he get the memo that only Kaya Kalis, his husband, is allowed to do business with Russia and profit? from doing business with Russia to the tune of $30 million, according to uh, the statement from Peter Siarto. <laughs> I love it. Triple hypocrisy. Ah. Mr. Siarto, it's too easy, isn't it? It's too easy owning these, uh, these EU <laughs> officials, isn't it? <laughs> they make it too easy. Anyway, everybody, that's the video, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, Twitter, Twitter X, and go to the Duran shop. 10% off. Use the code, no, 20% off. I always say 10%. 20% off. Use the code, the Duran20. Pick up the special edition Elensky green jacket. And, uh, and I'm gonna sign out. Franz Joseph, 1890, 1893, Albertina.